So uh, welcome everyone to April 2012 Grand Rounds. The subject for today is compartmental syndromes. We have an all-star cast from resident level up to senior, senior faculty level. And we're going to go straight to the action with Kyle Chun, who's going to give us an overview of compartmental syndrome. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the, the Department of Orthopedic Surgery Grand Rounds. My name is Kyle Chun. I'm a current uh, PGY4 in the department. Our topic today, as uh, introduced by Dr. San Jordan, is uh, one of great dilemma and consequence in our profession. Uh, compartment syndrome is rare, but it ranks high as far as impact and patient outcomes and medical liability. So a brief outline before we get started. I'm going to go over a review of compartmental syndromes. This is going to be followed by um, one of our guest speakers, Dr. Starnes from the Division of Vascular Surgery. is going to go over uh, pathophysiology, Dr. Bure. Uh, we'll visit surgical approaches, and we're going to go over two clinical scenarios. And uh, then we're going to have some commentary by Dr. Hansen and Dr. Matson at the closure of today. So I'm going to start first with a definition of a compartmental syndrome. This is from Dr. Matson's work in the 70s. A condition in which increased pressure within a limited space compromises the circulation and function of tissues within that space. Kind of keep this definition in mind as we talk about diagnostic criteria and uh, diagnostic methods. So brief history, Dr. Uh, Richard von Volkmann was the first to describe what we now call compartmental syndromes uh, in 1881 in one of his articles. Uh, he noted um, contractures of the forearm flexors that he thought was due to venous congestion and overtight bandages. This was later related to fractures in the forearm and was later found to uh, be associated with fractures of the lower leg. But it wasn't until uh, 1975 with uh, Dr. Matson's work that we had a unified concept of what a compartmental syndrome was what were the etiologies to it and how to treat it. So basic anatomy. So essentially, keeping in mind this definition of a compartmental syndrome, any closed space in the body can suffer this. This is uh, uh, shown in compartmental syndromes of the abdomen. It can even be space occupying, uh, occupying lesions um, in, the, uh, in the head. There's a closed space, you increase the pressure in there, and you're going to um, compromise the tissues. For our purposes today, we're going to talk about the extremities, um, most notably the fascial compartments of the forearm and the leg. Dr. Bure will go over this in further detail, so I'm not going to um, delve into that this time. Brief demographics, this comes out of McQueen's article in 2000. Approximately 7 per 100,000 uh, males uh, get a compartment syndrome per year, and is slightly under 1 per 100,000 females. Primary cause is fracture. Etiologies. So with Dr. Matson's work as well as his definition of a compartmental syndrome in mind, um, we, there's prerequisites that exist for the development of a compartmental syndrome. First, that you need a limiting tissue, tissue envelopes, fascial compartments of the lower extremity, fascial compartments of the forearm, um, the uh, abdominal cavity. And uh, secondly, you need increased pressure within that compartment. Now within, the, within this uh, light, you can look at kind of three basic etiologies for developing a compartmental syndrome. First of all, decreased volume of this compartment. This can occur with overzealous traction on an extremity or closure of fascial defects. Second, increased content of a compartment. This is by far the most common. Fracture causing swelling in the compartment, uh, vascular permeability as you see in burns, cellular damages and crush injury, uh, uh, fluid extravasation, hematoma formation. And thirdly, an externally applied pressure in the form of casts, splints, positioning aids um, intraoperatively, or someone who's found down on an extremity. So clinical assessment. So what do we do when we see a patient that we think may have a compartmental syndrome? So after talking with a lot of our faculty members and all the reading that I've done preparing for this today, I think the number one thing to take home from this is maintain a high level of suspicion for anybody that may develop this. Um, you just have to, if, you don't, if you're not thinking about it, you're not going to catch it, essentially. So think about the mechanism. The vast majority of these that we're going to see are going to be high mechanism injuries, but they can occur at relatively innocuous injury. There's case reports in the literature of compartmental syndromes of the leg developing after muscle biopsies, skin biopsies, closed unimalleolar ankle fractures. So just because it's not a tibia fracture, it's not a both bone forearm fracture, does not mean that they cannot get a compartmental syndrome. And the second, and the last thing is a predisposing condition. Is this patient an anticoagulated patient that may be at risk of developing uh, intracompartmental hematoma? Do they have any sort of pre, um, uh, comorbid conditions that might predispose them to this? And lastly, the five Ps. We're all taught in medical school of these uh, 
Five P's of compartmental syndrome that are our diagnostic criteria, pain, pallor, poikilothermia, paresthesias, paralysis. But uh, anybody you ask that has seen a compartmental syndrome before and has treated these, if you wait for these five things to develop, you've missed the boat and you essentially have, uh, you're in a salvage mode at that point. So we would, uh, I would suggest that uh, that is not, that should not be your clinical diagnosis. So the essential elements of a diagnosis is that you have to demonstrate evidence of increased tissue pressure, insufficient tissue perfusion, and loss of function in that compartment. So most reliable, most reliable clinical findings that I can find in the literature, and uh, just kind of talking with uh, as many people as I could, is pain out of proportion to the injury. So anybody who is having an increasing need, that an, ins an insatiable need for pain medications after a relatively innocuous injury, or a bad injury, but something that is kind of out of the ballpark in terms of what they're needing. Uh, pain on compression of the compartment of uh, concern, as well as the actual turgor and the, firm, the firmness of that compartment. Pain on passive stretch of a muscle involved in that compartment. Hypesthesia of any of nerves that may be running through that compartment itself, as well as muscle weakness. The last two of these being later clinical findings. Diagnostic imaging, is there any role for this? X-ray. Uh, since we know that the most common cause of compartmental syndrome is a fracture, we want to get x-rays of that extremity. That's where we should start. Is there any role for MRI? So Rominger in 1995 looked at MRI for, to aid in the diagnosis of compartment syndrome. Essentially, they can tell you if you have one and your muscle's necrotic, but they cannot tell you whether or not you have an impending or developing compartment syndrome. The same goes for Doppler, and the same goes for near-infrared spectroscopy. So essentially, get an x-ray of the extremity, there's no other imaging modality that's going to diagnose this for you. So compart uh, compartment pressure monitoring. After Dr. Matson's work in the 70s, a lot of excitement was geared towards trying to figure out a way that we can try and uh, measure the inter intercompartmental pressure to see if we can predict the development of, of a compartment syndrome. All of these devices kind of function on the idea of a continuous water column between the compartment as well as uh, going down to a some sort of mechanical electronic manometer trying to give us an idea of what the actual intercompartmental pressure is. The problem with this is interpretation of the results. Do we use an absolute pressure? Some authors have suggested an absolute pressure anywhere between 30, 40, or 50 millimeters of mercury. The problem with this is that the actual perfusion of the compartment itself can vary depending on what the mean arterial pressure is as well as the, um, uh, or the diastolic blood pressure. So should we be looking at a delta P, which is the difference in pressure between most commonly the diastolic pressure or the uh, um, mean arterial pressure? And McQueen's work in 1996 kind of looked at this most, uh, uh, most critically. And the number that we mo most people go by at this time is about 30 millimeters of mercury below the diastolic pressure as a threshold for uh, the diagnosis of a compartment syndrome based on pressure. And a time factor. And this is not really well laid out in the literature at this time is how long does ha something have to, how long does the pressure have to be up in order for you to get permanent damage? Uh, a lot of these monitors that we're using nowadays, uh, similar to like the striker needle or these handheld manometers that can uh, give us a pressure uh, monitoring at one period of time are not giving us uh, what's been happening over the last six hours, what might happen in the next six. We're getting one measurement at one period of time. We have no idea if we're at the nadir or not. And what are the indications for pressure monitoring? After looking through a lot of stuff, uh, I think the basic idea of developing indications for um, measuring somebody's compartment pressure should be an unconscious patient, somebody you cannot examine, someone who's a paraplegic, where you're not going to have these clinical findings that you can rest on, and someone who has equivocal findings that you need uh, an, additional, uh, an additional set of data to make your decision. So delay in diagnosis. When's it too late? When you develop tissue necrosis, this can depend on how long it's been going on, the metabolism of the mus uh, muscle and the tissue in the compartment. Sequel of a delay in diagnosis, persistent neurologic deficit, infection, renal failure, contractors amputation, possibly death due to multisystem organ failure or sepsis. And uh, finally, for my part of the talk, is litigation. So, a sing, um, just looking at kind of closed claims for uh, compartmental syndromes. Uh, 64 claims over 16 years for a single insurer in one publication. 56% of these were settled out of court at an average of approximately half a million dollars per case settlement. 
the Academy in the mid 90s also put out, a risk, um, put out some risk management guidelines. Second to spine surgery, tibia fractures were the most, uh, were the second most uh, highest uh, in claims across our entire specialty. Those associated with compartment syndrome are most expensive, averaging about $900,000 per settlement for a compartment syndrome associated with a tibia fracture. Um, and things associated with developing, sorry, with uh, going to litigation were poor patient communication, uh, not obtaining a vascular consultation, uh, incomplete release of compartment syndromes, or delay in diagnosis from the first onset of symptoms. So with that in mind, we're going to turn to uh, Dr. Starnes. He's the uh, Chief of Vascular Surgery here at the University of Washington. He's going to talk to us more about the pathophysiology. Good morning. The purpose of this exercise for me is to review the pathophysiology of compartment syndrome. Uh, the pathogenesis uh, is based primarily on local hemodynamics. Uh, I'm also going to go into three theories of why compartment syndromes develop. Uh, the critical closing pressure theory, the absolute ICP threshold theory, and the dynamic ICP threshold theory. First talking about uh, hemodynamics. The unifying feature of compartment syndrome uh, is that there is an increase in the intracompartmental pressure, or the ICP, that impairs tissue perfusion. And this can be explained by the uh, uh, law of Poisset, which is uh, described there. Uh, F is the capillary blood flow. The delta P is the pressure gradient that it, uh, spans across the capillaries from the precapillary arteriole to the postcapillary venule. The R is the radius of the capillary, or the capillary bed. The um, mu is the uh, viscosity of the blood, and the L is the length of the capillary. You can see here that the viscosity of the blood and the length of the capillary stay relatively the same and do not affect capillary blood flow. Increasing intracompartmental pressure alters only two of the variables in Poisset's equation. That is the delta P. Uh, as the intracompartmental pressure rises, pressure is transmitted to the postcapillary venules, increasing the venous pressure and decreasing the delta P. So you decrease the, the pressure gradient across the two. And radius, as the ICP or the intracompartmental pressure increases, it decreases the capillary radius by collapsing the capillaries uh, and decreasing capillary blood flow. The first theory of compartmental uh, syndrome was described again by Matson in the 70s, and uh, that was based on the critical closing pressure. Uh, the CCP was that described as that pressure above which capillaries collapse and blood flow is arrested. This was controversial uh, and became controversial over the, over the next two decades, and two studies actually refuted this theory. Instead, the arteriovenous pressure gradient was considered to be the critical determinant of capillary blood flow. The absolute intracompartmental pressure threshold theory uh, is that, uh, it, or describes what threshold the intracompartmental pressure produces tissue injury and cell death. What is that absolute pressure? Some people have said 30, some people have said 35, some people have said 40. Uh, but the work of Hargens and colleagues uh, in 1981 uh, looked at dogs, and basically the intracompartmental pressure of 30 millimeters mercury for more than eight hours universally produced muscle necrosis in normotensive dogs. And so the key word here is normotensive. I want you to remember that. An intracompartmental pressure of less than 30 produced no necrosis in this dog model. Let's move on to the dynamic intracompartmental pressure threshold theory. And this describes changes in arterial pressure that affect the AV pressure gradient, altering compartmental blood flow. And this, this relates to the patient's actual blood pressure. Um, the pressure threshold relative to the, either the mean arterial pressure or the diastolic blood pressure. Again, in a, in a study in dogs, uninjured, tish, or uninjured muscle develops tissue ischemia and necrosis when the difference between the mean arterial pressure and the intracompartmental pressure dropped below 30 when that gap was less than 30 millimeters mercury. Also found in this particular study was that injured muscle showed greater sensitivity to ischemia, and that threshold was less than 40 millimeters mercury. McQueen and Court Brown from Edinburgh, Scotland in 1996 looked at 116 patients with tibial plateau fractures and looked at the dynamic intracompartmental pressure. 
What they found is that an absolute intercompartmental pressure threshold of 30 millimeters mercury, when they use that as the dynamic pressure, 43% of the patients would have required a fasciotomy. And they had uh, patients in this series that had compartmental pressures of greater than 50 and yet went on to have full function after developing a compartment syndrome. But, those, but the compartment syndrome was not, uh, uh, did not lead to fasciotomy in several patients, and those patients did not have any adverse sequelae as long as their dynamic pressure uh, was not less than 30 millimeters mercury. And this suggests that a dynamic ICP threshold relative to either mean arterial pressure or diastolic blood pressure is more appropriate for selecting patients for fasciotomy. A little bit about ischemia reperfusion. Ischemia and reperfusion increases the compartment volume by causing muscle tissue injury that results in interstitial edema. Uh, the increased microvascular permeability permits an efflux of plasma proteins and progressive edema formation. And with reperfusion, oxygen or free oxygen radicals are generated that cause lipid peroxidation or destruction of the cell membranes, further enhancing uh, permeability and exacerbating the edema. One slide on the susceptibility of compartments to uh, compartment syndrome. For dense arterial ischemia that lasts more than six hours, the anterior compartment is the most susceptible compartment to uh, ischemia and reperfusion, followed by the lateral, then the superficial posterior, and finally the deep posterior muscle compartment. And for these reasons, I personally always assess the anterior compartment first when doing a uh, fasciotomy. Uh, this is my reference. Uh, my good friend Greg Madral uh, wrote this chapter in vascular surgery, uh, the seventh edition of Rutherford's, and um, I refer you to that for any further questions or comments. Next, we're going to turn to uh, David Bure. Morning. It's good to be here. Uh, I've got a lot to cover, so let's get started. Uh, though some of the diagnostics I think remain debatable, what's clear that uh, uh, currently is that the only acceptable treatment for a compartmental syndrome is a surgical fasciotomy. And basically that means we have to open the box and there are some experimental uh, treatments such as ultrafiltration and anti-inflammatory medications, but at best I think these remain adjunctive and experimental. What's clear about fasciotomy is that they need to be complete and thorough. The skin and fascial incisions need to be of an appropriate length, and they also need to be done in consideration for any subsequent surgical procedures. It's imperative that we all have to understand our anatomy, which is pretty obvious, uh, and we also have to be timely with managing these particular injuries. So let's get into specifics. The leg is commonly associated with compartmental syndrome, and functionally the leg musculature demonstrates four compartments, an anterior, lateral, and two posterior compartments, the superficial and deep. And whether the tib post muscle is contained within its own fascial compartment is really controversial and is probably more appropriate to the chronic exertional type compartmental syndromes than the acute. Decompression of all four compartments can be achieved through a two incision or a single incision technique and the two incision technique has traditionally been felt to be more of an anatomically simpler and more reliable uh, fasciotomy in achieving entrance into all four compartments, particularly the deep posterior compartment. The medial incision is placed posterior to the posteromedial tibial crest and the saphenous vein and nerve are protected. The fascia distally in the wound is opened immediately adjacent to the tibia and the flexor digitorum longus is identified as is the neurovascular bundle and that indicates entrance into that deep posterior compartment. Approximately the origin of the soleus musculature is elevated off the tibia to affect a, a, a more fuller deep uh, decompression. Elevation of the posterior skin flap will identify the medial aspect of the transverse septum of the fascia post and the fascia posterior to this is incised longitudinally effectively resulting in decompression of the superficial posterior compartment. Laterally, the incision is placed some variable distance between the fibula, the anterior aspect of the fibula, and a midpoint between the fibula and the tibial crest. The septum dividing the anterior from the lateral compartments is then identified, and both compartments are then released with long fascial incisions as we can see here. The single incision fasciotomy previously described by Dr. Matson achieves the same goals but through release of all four compartments through a single incision performed over the fibula and I find this technique to be particularly useful in the setting of compartmental syndrome associated with tibial fractures since the intermedial skin remains untouched surgically. Skin and subcutaneous flaps are elevated off the fascia anteriorly and posteriorly. 
the anterior and posterior intermuscular septae are identified in the superficial posterior, lateral, and anterior compartment fascia are incised. The deep posterior compartment is released by first identifying the posterior intermuscular septum indicated here by the white arrow. The perineal musculature is elevated and the insertion of the posterior intermuscular septum on the posterolateral border of the fibula is identified. Then the insertion of the septum is then released from the fibula, avoiding the perineal artery and the perineal veins. And this effectively results in entrance into the deep posterior compartment. The thigh is uncommonly involved in compartmental syndrome. The three compartments are identified, including the anterior quadriceps compartment, the posterior or hamstring compartment, and the medial or adductor compartment. Release begins with the familiar lateral longitudinal incision from the trochanteric region proximally to the condylar region distally. The iliotibial band is incised over the same length, which strongly initiates a decompressive process. The thin fascia over the vastus lateralis is identified and easily separated from the undersurface of the posterior portion of the iliotibial band. The fascia of the vastus lateralis is incised adjacent to the posterolateral aspect of the femur. and perforating vessels may need to be cauterized. And at this point, the anterior compartment is effectively released. And what's encountered posteriorly is the lateral intermuscular septum as it emanates from the iliotibial tract to, the, to join the linea aspera of the femur. Incising the lateral intermuscular septum results in decompression of the posterior hamstring compartment, and then the medial compartment typically needs to be assessed at that point. And while a lot of the medial compartment will be decompressed by releasing the anterior and posterior compartments, if there's any suspicion, an additional medial-sided incision can be uh, performed in the fascia over the adductor musculature can be released or incised. The gluteal compartment is rarely involved in compartmental syndrome, but when it occurs, it's typically a fairly devastating situation. Common scenarios are the person who is found down or has sustained a severe crush injury. The three gluteal compartments are all a function of the proximal portion of the tensor fascia lata. The tensor fascia muscle and gluteus maximus are enclosed within anterior and posterior divisions of the fascia lata, while the gluteus medius is enclosed by the fascia lata superficially and the osseous ileum on its deeper surface. The best surgical approach to the gluteal compartments is with the familiar coker langenbeck type exposure. Here, the planned surgical incision and relevant osseous anatomy is drawn on the skin, and in a different patient, a large gluteal hematoma is encountered at the time of this gluteal fasciotomy. Similar to the leg, the forearm is a common anatomic area for the development of compartmental syndrome. Five separate compartments are anatomically described, including superficial and deep volar and dorsal compartments, and the dorsal radial mobile wad musculature. Several different volar incisions have been described that allow for native skin coverage of the median nerve and tendinous structures until limb edema and delayed definitive wound coverage occurs. Volarly, the incision should allow decompression of the Lacerda's fibrosis at the antecubital fossa at the elbow and similarly decompression of the carpal tunnel at the wrist. And after a dissection through the subcutaneous tissue, the fascia overlying the FCU is incised, resulting in entrance into the superficial volar compartment. Retraction of the FCU and flexor digitorum superficialis allows release of the fascia of the deep volar compartment, and release of the volar compartments often results in decompression of the dorsal and the mobile wad musculature, but once again, similar to the thigh, if concern remains, then these compartments require a formal release. And dorsally, the interval between the ECRB and extensor digitorum communis allows release of the mobile wad, as well as the superficial and deep dorsal compartments. Unfortunately, a number a form compartment syndrome to present with fractures of the radius and ulnar shafts. And in these situations, though, Henry's exposure allows adequate release of the mobile wad and the superficial and deep compartments volarly while allowing traditional access or familiar access for open reduction internal fixation of the radial shaft and the ulna. The standard approach to the ulna between the extensor and flexor compartments allows dorsal compartment decompression if necessary. And at the end of it, full release of forearm compartments and the ability to perform RIF of both the radius and ulna uh, are all been sat have all been satisfied. Compartment syndrome of the arm is exceedingly unusual. The arm demonstrates an anterior and posterior compartments uh, through which the radial nerve travels from posterior to anterior and the ulnar nerve from anterior to posterior, excuse me, vice versa. Release of the arm compartments is dependent on situation. The, the familiar exposure here by Gerwin and Hotchkiss allows release of the posterior compartments initially. 
radial nerve is followed to the lateral intermuscular septum and then by incising the lateral intermuscular septum, both distal and proximal to the radial nerve perforation through the intermuscular septum, the anterior compartment can be effectively entered. And this is a, a good exposure when associated compartmental syndromes have uh, a distal or mid-humeral shaft fracture. More proximally, the deltoid musculature can also be addressed. A lateral exposure can similarly be utilized using the same muscular radial nerve uh, relationships and has been described by Drs. Mills, Mills, Hannels, and Smith. The deep dissection utilizes the relationship of the radial nerve and release of the anterior and posterior compartments can be form, performed, uh, which is especially useful in someone who is in the supine position or patients who have more proximal humeral shaft fractures or more proximal revascularization type procedures. Muscle handling. Once the compartments are open, the musculature is evaluated, and the goal is to determine, of course, the viability of the musculature. If the presentation is substantially delayed, such that there's a high likelihood that the musculature is dead, then the compartments really should not be opened, and this clearly requires both good information and good judgment. A critical point regarding muscle evaluation is that a hemostat or some other instrument should be used to spread within the substance of the musculature. So oftentimes, the outer surface of the musculature may appear viable while the deeper portions are completely necrotic. So basically, we're going to leave living muscle, we're going to excise or debris non-viable muscle. And while that sounds simple, I think occasionally it can get substantially more complex than that. And that leads to the dilemma of what to do when the compartment is opened and extensive necrosis is identified. As Kyle said, we have problems with sepsis, problems with renal failure, functional limb impairment, and as, uh, if associated with a fracture, problems with fracture healing. So you made the call to open the compartment because I think it's frequently extremely hard to know when the ischemic process really began, and so what do you do? And I think here are some of the options. You can debride the compartment until it can be closed primarily, which may save limb function, but is at the risk of wound sepsis. You can debride everything that's dead, which of course gives you less risk of sepsis, but is in an increasingly useless limb will ensue, or an amputation, which of course has functional impl implications depending on the salvage level. There's no question that this is dependent on the patient, the limb, and the compartments that are involved. Here's an example of a miscompartmental syndrome in the setting of a bicondylar tibial plateau fracture that ultimately results in a reasonably good out outcome with salvage methods with debridement here of the complete anterior compartment. Here's a revascularization procedure from a ballistic femoral artery injury that results in necrosis of all four leg compartments necessitating an above knee amputation. Once again, just illustrative of the compartments involved, the level involved, and the patient and injury that are associated with it. Managing the wound. There's no question there's lots of ways to manage the fasciotomy wound and a number of factors are to be considered. And for me, probably the most pressing concern is that I often still have to fix an underlying tibial fracture uh, that comes with this compartmental syndrome. So some options. Open wound care is suboptimal because of the wound exposure to the hospital environment and the resultant saturation of dressings and bedding are really poorly tolerated by the patient and make nursing care challenging. A variety of simple dermatotraction techniques such as the Vessi loop shoelace technique seen here prevent skin retraction and may allow more of the wound to be primarily closed in a delayed fashion. More recently, vacuum-assisted closure type devices are increasingly utilized with or without dermatotraction and have a number of advantages including decreasing edema and increasing vascular proliferation in the wound and most importantly to me, isolating the wound from the nosocomial environment. Delayed primary closure is possible in some of these wounds but typically, typically cannot be performed for several days. The desire to perform primary closure should be tempered as can be seen in this case where the wound was simply intolerant of the tension applied despite an adequate time of delay. Resultant skin ischemia across the anterior aspect of the leg was dramatic and this of course necessitated release of the suture material and ultimately restoration of perfusion of the skin at the immediate uh, or the index uh, procedure where it was closed. Split thickness skin grafting, uh, as done here in the preceding patient, ultimately provides a durable skin coverage, but certainly has some draw cosmetic drawbacks, uh, and once again for me is uh, problematic sometimes in planning definitive fracture surgery, as the split thickness skin graft does take a, a fair amount of time to mature and to be um, properly colonized with appropriate and normal skin bacteria. So in summary, we're going to leave you where we started, you know, uh, fasciotomies need to be complete and thorough. They need to be appropriate length with appropriate dermal and fascial incis inc incisions. And in consideration of all other surgical procedures or subsequent procedures should be uh, thought out. You have to understand your anatomy and you have to do this in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm.
So at this time, I'd like to have uh, Drs. Hansen and Dr. Uh, Matson uh, have a seat up here in the panel. We're going to go over two case presentations, and then we'll go over some commentary and uh, open the floor up for questions. So this is our first case. It's a 22-year-old uh, male bicyclist who's struck by a car. He's alert and oriented when you see him in the ED. He's a closed, uh, isolated injury of the uh, lower extremity, no fracture. He has firm compartments, no pain with passive stretch. And I'll uh, send this first question to Dr. Hansen. How would you evaluate this patient and what would be your initial management? Is this a contusion, basically? A contusion on the leg. Yeah. Well, the first thing, uh, you're, you're going to obviously see if all the, all the function, the, the neurovascular function is intact and uh, prepare to, be, to monitor it. And uh, the one thing you want to check very carefully is what the patient's blood pressure is and um, find out how much elevation or how much swelling he'll tolerate because this is related. Uh, you want to be careful not to, uh, to uh, elevate it too much because that will decrease the arterial pressure in relation to the tissue pressure and cause a problem. Uh, also be careful not to ice too much if you're thinking about that. Ice and elevation, of course, is nice for relatively minor injuries, but a little bit dangerous for serious injuries. Uh, and then you'll monitor his function very carefully. Some people would do that with um, these various devices and start thinking about all these equations that Dr. Starnes recommended, but uh, I'd just like to talk to the patients and uh, use my fingers and my eyes and ears and see how things go. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Matson. how would your uh, management change if this patient is now intubated and unexaminable? Well, the most sensitive uh, indication of compartmental ischemia is the patient uh, being awake and being able to tell you if it, you have pain out of proportion or pain on passive stretch, as you've nicely indicated. Um, before the patient becomes unconscious, I think we have to agree that this is a patient that we'd like to admit, conscious or unconscious, so we can watch them, because sending a patient home like this is a risk. Now our patient's gotten to be unconscious, so we have to do all the usual things of evaluating the head injury and other multi multiple system injury possibilities. But as far as the compartments are concerned, now we have to monitor the patient in the absentia of their uh, neurologic help. And so that probably is going to require sequential pressure measurements, one of the unusual uh, indications for this. And the most important thing that I think hasn't been mentioned so far is the handoff from one observer to another. Just like in the 4x100 relay, the most common mistake that's made is passing the baton. And so that if I'm signing out to you. I need to make sure that I go over everything about this patient, what their pressures are, what our, uh, what our plan is, so that you have a hands-on handoff, because in the absence of that, uh, there's a real opportunity for making a mistake. So I think sequential pressure measurements, watching the patient. The other thing you can use that's interesting, if a patient has a severe head injury, is you can use the Babinski sign. If they have an upgoing toe, that's a nice way that you can evaluate the function of their uh, of their anterior compartmental musculature. And Dr. Beret, does would this management change at all if this if this X-ray was different and he had a tibial shaft fracture and associated with this intubated patient firm compartments? Yeah, you know, I think for me it just increases the level of suspicion. One of the things that you talked about earlier, you know, and and you just start having more and more um, of the odds leaning towards compartmental syndrome, and so uh, to me that uh, that increases my um, awareness and lowers my threshold for being more aggressive at, uh, at confirming or, or, or treating a potential diagnosis. I think what Dr. Matson said is real important. You know, this is, this is not a single snapshot in time. You know, you've, you've got to reevaluate these people and it's best to be reevaluated by the same person again and again. Um, and, and, uh, and you just don't want to examine this person then, and then see them 24 hours later. You know, this has to be a repeated thing. This next case I'll uh, direct towards Dr. Starnes. This is a 57-year-old male who had a cardiac transplant uh, three years ago. He's on uh, Coumadin. He struck his arm two days prior to uh, evaluation. He's had progressive swelling of the arm and the forearm for two days. In the ER, he has an INR of four, and he has extreme pain with uh, passive stretch of the elbow in the anterior part of the arm. What would be your uh, evaluation of this patient? So the, a lot of the important comments have already been said, but the first thing is to examine the patient, uh, do a detailed 
pulse exam uh, of the radi radial and ulnar arteries uh, and to do a, a good neurovascular exam. Um, I think that this is obviously a, a patient that's had a hemorrhagic complication from being over anticoagulated. And so the, you know, one of the first strategies would be to correct the INR of four and to, uh, to give um, FFP to, to get that uh, corrected. And then I think that based on this patient's symptoms of extreme pain that uh, I would have a very low threshold for taking this patient to the operating room and doing a, a fasciotomy. Ben, how, uh, how low do you need that INR before you take that patient? You know, we, it's funny, we as vascular surgeons are a little bit of a different breed because we're not afraid of anticoagulation, but we like to get that, uh, that INR down uh, below 1.6 or so. Okay. The next question is for, uh, sorry, this is uh, for commentary. So for Dr. Hansen, over your career, what are some of the biggest mistakes you've seen with dealing with a compartmental syndrome? Well, it's uh, the, first of all, I, I you know I, I'll have to um, say again that I'm uh, I think that what I've said over the years many times is that people need to read Dr. Matson's book about once a year. Um, we've been talking about this this morning a little bit. Uh, it takes me uh, every year I find something new in it that applies more as we learn more from clinical work. We see that the basic work that he did has application here and there. And the other thing that he just said is the most important in terms of I've been involved in lots of medical legal suits. I get called as an expert in the most typical thing, single most common thing that happens when somebody gets a real problem and has a, eventually winds up in a medical legal problem is that there's been a handoff. Somebody sees somebody on, on Friday night, takes care of an injury and hands it off to his partner for the weekend. And it gets dropped. And they, it, 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 it's not... Uh, evaluated frequently enough or with enough kind of knowledge. You know how it is. If you don't, you're not the one that worked up the patient and got invested in them, you don't ever do quite the same job unless you guys, maybe nowadays because there's so much of this, it's getting different. But in my generation, if you didn't, you weren't the one that worked it up, you never really kind of caught up. And so that's been the single most common thing. Another thing that happened is that people open a wound they look at the superficial tissue and it looks fine, so they think, well, this is no big deal. And down deep, the muscle's dead or dying. Mm -hmm. So evaluating, as Dr. Bray was talking about, evaluating the wound after you've opened it is, a, is an area where you can get in big trouble. <coughs> then the, another thing is that they will uh, evacuate at a compartment that's dead where there's been a fracture and then just leave it as a dead space. That can be either in an acute compartment syndrome or it can be in a very late chronic one where the compartment's dead and kind of calcified and there's a bunch of stuff like toothpaste in there. And if you evacuate those and leave nothing in the space, you can have a disaster. You'll get an osteomyelitis. There was a paper a few years ago that pointed out that and they kind of reviewed the literature. Every patient that had had that late compartment syndrome evacuated, got osteomyelitis and lost their leg. So they advised never treat that. Well, there's a good way to solve that problem. You can do it either immediately with um, an acute compartment syndrome or late, certainly in the late ones, because you know the other muscles are all right. You can bring the, the posterior tibial tendon up into the anterior compartment from up very high and fill the dead space, close the wound, and you'll stop that tendency to infection. Because you, you can't just leave a big contaminated dead space in the leg. And so there's lots of things. I'll, I'll wait to any other things to so somebody else <laughs> pitches in, but there's lots of ways you can get in trouble with this problem. Thank you. So Dr. Matson, so there's a couple of uh, points that we want to talk about with you, and we'll kind of go through those. So observing for compartment syndrome, can you touch on elevate, elevation of the leg? So um, this was nicely mentioned earlier by Dr. Stearns, but there, it's important to realize that every 1.36 centimeters that you raise the leg lowers the local arterial blood pressure by one millimeter of mercury. So you can do the math and it was pretty interesting to see how often when I first got into this business the initial treatment for people that had ischemia was to elevate the leg which just made the ischemia worse because you can't lower the local <coughs> venous pressure by elevating the leg because that's defined by the pressure in the compartment so the only thing you accomplish by elevating the leg is to lower the, lower the local arterial pressure, which diminishes the capillary blood flow, which exacerbates the ischemia. So 
I think that it really needs to be understood that once somebody has symptoms of ischemia, that's not the time to elevate the leg. How do you feel about pressure measurement when our diagnosis is clinically clear from our findings? Right, so this is a mistake that's commonly being made today is people allow pressure measurements to override what the patient's telling them and what your eyes and ears are telling you. And I, I think that it's probably not unnecessary to do pressure measurements in somebody who says, my, my leg is comfortable, I can wiggle my toes up and down. Your best monitor of them is how they're feeling and what they're telling you with sequential observations. Uh, if a patient has obvious tense compartment can't move their foot, screaming in pain, you don't need pressure measurements there either. It's just a delay. So the only time I think that pressure measurements are indicated is in equivocal cases, as in the example you gave us of somebody who's not able to help you with their observations. And I think the idea of 30 millimeters of mercury or even some pressure gap between diastolic or mean blood pressure and the compartmental pressure is interesting, but it's not important on an individual patient basis because every patient, as Dr. Stearns points out, has a different tolerance for ischemia. So you can't know that. None of us can know that. The only person that knows that is the patient, and they will tell you with their pain and with their function. Well, do you think there's a role for arteriograms? So again, when I got into this, everybody that had ischemia was taken down to get an arteriogram, which just delayed getting to the OR by another six hours. So I think it, this was back in the old days where people were thinking that the root uh, pathophysiology of compartmental syndromes was like arterial occlusion or arterial spasm, which may play a role, but it's, again, not important. What's important is getting the person with ischemia to the operating room as quickly as possible. Can you touch on incomplete compartmental releases? There was a, a fascination for a while with what, what people were calling sports model fasciotomies where you'd sort of make a little nick and slide some scissors or even a menis meniscotome uh, down the fascia to see if you could decompress things underneath. But as again you point out, you really want to open all the envelopes and the skin can become a limiting boundary. So it's sort of a paradox, but you can release the compartments, but if you don't release the skin, then the skin becomes a limiting boundary. So you've really got to relay, release everything from top to bottom and make sure that all four compartments are released as David nicely showed. And something that we haven't really touched on at all is stabilization of a fracture when associated with a compartment syndrome. So what's interesting there is that uh, you have a tibial fracture and a compartmental syndrome. Well, the, the tense compartments are sort of acting like an air split around that fracture and give a lot of fracture stability. But as soon as you decompress it, that stable leg all of a sudden becomes really unstable. So um, it, I think it's really important for the management of the wound, for the management of the soft tissues that Dave and Ted have always mentioned. You've got to get that fracture stabilized, whether it's with an X-fix or uh, a plate or uh, an IM nail. But it's, it makes the wound management a lot easier if that fracture is stable. Then you can devote your attention to the soft tissues, which is what the priority becomes. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we'll open up the floor to any questions for our panel. First of all, I want to thank you and the panel for an excellent review and presentation. And I know on behalf of my colleagues at Harborview, we, after two and a half decades of experience, we've really probably seen the whole gamut of this uh, injury as well as hopefully saved a lot of limbs by uh, nipping these in the bud. However, I think you need to have high vigilance when you're in practice for this because I know Bruce and I shared a case, I believe it was a young individual who did not have a fracture, had a sprain with a skateboard injury and was referred to us in late. And the two errors that were made, I felt, were that um, there wasn't enough sequential vigilance on the part of the monitoring physicians and staff to pick up this patient's complaints. <clears throat> And despite an innocuous or relatively innocuous injury, I think it was just an ankle sprain, though it may have been a lateral malleolus fracture, he went on and developed a fulminant dead anterior and lateral compartments, and um, he was referred in late. So don't think that this can't happen without uh, a fracture or something as innocuous as just an ankle sprain, because it, it can. And I think um, I want to thank all my colleagues and, of course, the panel, because you've done a really good job in educating us and the public. Thanks. Dr. Dunbar? 
Yeah, I just want to echo exactly what Brad said, and like anything else, the most difficult thing to pick up is often the atypical presentation of something. And there's a entity um, called exertional or chronic compartmental syndrome, which is typically found in, <coughs> in, seen in clinic, but there's also the more insidious or acute on chronic compartment syndrome. And when I was in the military, as Ben maybe and uh, Dr. Hansen perhaps you, you saw also, those are the ones that get missed because they, they were, these were guys who ran, got their exertional compartment syndrome, the sim similar symptoms that would have otherwise gone away but were either forced by their sergeant or through their own diligence to keep running until they tr changed from a temporary situation into a, an acute compartmental syndrome. So you really got to be much more uh, vigilant with one like that with an atypical presentation. Dr. Hansen. There's a couple things I left out that I think we should say in the, in the exam. Um, remind me what Dr. Matson said. When you're looking at a patient to see if they got a compartment syndrome, one of the biggest mistakes that people would say, wiggle your toes, and they wiggle their toes, and if you got sensation, and they got sensation, they say, well, then you're fine. Not so. If it's at the right compartment, you can have something dying in your leg while you're still able to wiggle your toes and still have sensation because they don't all go the same. So that's an inadequate exam. The, the most critical one of all is, unless there's something wrong with the patient's nervous system, is the amount of pain they have. And the, one of the big mistakes is that they'll say that the doctor will decide that the patient's a wimp. And that's why they're complaining so much and lying and screaming in pain, because they can look like they're being a little hysteric. But they're hysteric because they hurt like hell. And you can't ignore that. And that's a, a big fault in terms of medical legal things, is that the doctor has decided that it's the, the patient's psyche and not their leg that's bothering. And that's, that's a big one. And then the other thing is that you can get with athletes is it's the, the athlete and their family may be the problem. They get hurt in, a, in an away game. And it looks pretty bad and the doctor says, well, you should probably stay and we need to watch that. And they say, oh, no, we really want to go home. And they all give in and say, well, okay, you can go home. Well, then they get to the doc doctor 12 hours later and the leg's dead. So they have, to, you know, they have to be a good patient and you have to insist if somebody thinks they can get away with uh, you know, being non-monitored for 12 hours when you know that that's not likely, don't let them do that. Ted mentioned the wiggle the toes. We actually talk in the book about the wiggle the toes trap, which is if you have uh, a dead anterior compartment, you can still wiggle your toes by flexing them and then relaxing and flexing and relaxing. And unless you specifically ask for the patient to dorsiflex the toes, you can miss it. So there are a lot of traps out there. And the point that I'd like to make in conclusion is that uh, people are only going to see what are the two of these in their lifetime unless they're involved in a trauma practice. So the whole thing is to always maintain a high degree of awareness. And again, as everybody has mentioned, the key is when it doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. The patient's sitting there screaming and you've got their fracture stabilized or the patient had a so-called minor twist as Brad said or something like this and they're screaming in pain. The thing that we've got to do is, is, in all orthopedics is understand what's going on here because what they're telling me is not mapping on what would I'd expect from their other f features. You know, I'd have to say, you know, with Brad's point and everything like that, some of the most um, amazing compartmental syndromes I've seen have been in young males playing soccer that have had, they're not run over by a car, they're not, you know, <clears throat> they're playing a game. Uh, a couple of them haven't even had tibia fractures. They've just come off the, the field and, and this thing has progressed and that fellow that was up there that lost his lateral compartment, you know, he, he suffered for a couple of days at home before he finally said, this is, this is crazy, you know, and he came on in and uh, he didn't have a fracture, he didn't have anything that he could recall, but he was playing soccer and a, uh, the index of suspicion is like, what do you say about that, you know, mm -hmm. so I think everybody with pain, yeah. <laughs> you know, like a... A 50-year-old male with pain between his knees and his shoulder has a, gets an EKG kind of thing. You know, it's sometimes the way you have to approach some of these problems. The other group that people haven't mentioned so much is the folks that are <coughs> found down either after a seizure or because they're alcoholic or whatever, and they've been lying on any anatomical part for a while. We admit them, and initially they look good, but then they have post-ischemic swelling in that particular part, sometimes in their arms, sometimes in their legs, sometimes in their buttocks. And those are, that's another trap. You know, when on initial exam, everything seems fine, but then they, as their perfusion starts to pick up, they get this post-ischemic swelling and then develop secondary ischemia. So again, 
we just got to keep our eyes wide, wide open. Dr. San Jordan. I have a, a sort of two-part question. First is um, 30 years after Dr. Matson's book, we're still seeing compartmental syndromes, and I think a lot of it is people seen in the ER and sent home. So question one is how do we get the message to the ER docs? And question two is if they're missed and they get to you at day four or day six or day seven, is it too late to open it? And if it is, what do you do instead? I'm happy to take the latter one. I don't, that's easier than, than educating um, the front line sometimes uh, <laughs> because it's hard. That's a hard job. Um, I think that if you have a real discrete time frame when you think that you know when that event occurred uh, and their pain is starting to come on down, I, I think that that's, you've missed, the ship has sailed. You know? um, this takes uh, good information. And this takes really good judgment. And I think the, 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 the flagship for that is the papers that, that are written about uh, earthquake survivors who are, you know, a discrete time when the building collapsed. Uh, so you can infer that, okay, time starts now. And then these people show up 24 hours later. And, and the people that had the biggest problems with infection were in the groups that were opened. And so there's a, there's a consequence to opening dead muscle. And I think that I, I had one fellow that was playing uh, some sport in Chicago. Um, he, uh, he reveled that night uh, after their game uh, and he got on the plane uh, a day later and he was sore and uh, he uh, putzed around at home and then he finally came in. It was about four or five days later and his pain had come and gone and his ankle and his toes did not move up. And so that's a person that was like, ship has sailed. Um, I, I'm, I err on the side of opening things though because I, I, I can't know that time uh, unless it's so laid out like that. So I tend to be uh, uh, more aggressive with somebody, particularly the found down person who I think comes in and they've got a tense compartment. Well, how long has this been like this? You know, if you can tell me that they've, their buddies knew that they were down three days ago, then that's great. But if not, I feel like compelled I have to give it a chance. And that's when you open dead compartments, then the decision making is clean it out and close it, um, amputate it, you know, do things like that. Uh, and, and their kidney function, their sepsis risk, their limb function, their life all has to be weighed into that situation and who that patient is. Yeah. One very important thing is when you do all these, these observations and following people, be sure you put in the chart what you found and what you're thinking. Uh, because I, I had one case that I did a medical legal thing where a guy came along, kind of got caught in the emergency room, seeing a guy that they'd been watching in the emergency room for several days with an incipient compartment syndrome. He said, this is already dead, um, it shouldn't be open now. And he told that to his resident who was to tell it to the re referring uh, GP in the emergency room or the emergency room doctor and so forth, never wrote a thing in the chart. He had a big rival on her own faculty who came along a little later and they asked him and he said, oh my God, that stupid guy, we should have opened that. So he opened it, he got infected and lost his leg. Who got sued? The first guy. The first guy, mm -hmm. because he didn't write down what he said, he was right. Dr. Mosca? So this is a great review, and we found out that pain is the, the key feature. That's what we have to look for. Anesthesiologists don't like anybody to have pain. <laughs> and, um, and so they're always requesting whether we're going to take off a little toe or no matter how small the procedure, they want to do a peripheral nerve block. And they tell us that peripheral nerve blocks don't mask compartment syndromes. What's the knowledge and experience there? Um, I know just because I looking through the literature and I had, you know, I looked for that specific question and there's nothing, I mean, it's hard to do a prospective trial on any of this stuff, but there's nothing really addressing that one fact where peripheral nerve catheter, catheters, epidural blocks um, associated with compartment, compartmental syndrome. So my comment is I, I didn't see anything in the literature on my pre preparation for this. We had a clinical faculty member who's unfortunately passed away named Paul Brand. But he wrote a book called Pain, The Gift No One Wants. And it would be wonderful for uh, people to read that because it, it points out Vince's point is, you know, we were given pain for a reason. And pain tells us when things are not right. And if we take away that painful sensation, we're going to lose our ability to make these diagnoses. I, I, I salute Vince's point. Thank you so much for our panel. Uh, thank you, Dr. Matson, Dr. Hansen, Dr. Starr, and Dr. Beret for your time this morning. Thank you for the questions. Um, have a good day. Thanks, Kyle.